When he cries out to me, God says, I will hear him, for I am gracious. That's where we left off last time in Exodus 22. Our compassionate God hears because he is gracious. We began this service in Exodus 34 in our scripture reading where God reveals his name and his, his glory. Moses wants to see his glory and he reveals, he shows him his name and his name is the Lord, the Lord merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness to thousands and who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. God is compassionate and gracious in his loving kindness, forgiving all kinds of offenses. And his law of love calls us to reflect that loving kindness, that graciousness, and that forgiveness. He calls us to be slow to anger. He calls us to be forgiving as he has been with us. And I want to expand that theme today from Exodus to the book of Ephesians, if you would be turning there, because I can't think of a better way to round out this study and where we've been than turning to the book of Ephesians We've been looking at the law, and and the gospel also gives us more biblical help to live out this gracious forgiveness like God. We've seen law for property damage, but we need to apply the gospel more to personal offenses. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians 4 Verse 31, this is the word of our God. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We'll be continuing our studies in Exodus, looking at some of those offerings and sacrifices to God in the law. But I think it'll be good for us today to be in the New Testament in this text and look at some gospel applications for how We are to walk in that way in love. And there's a story that some of you have heard from years ago that I want to retell because I can't think of any better way to to illustrate the truth that we're going to look at today. It's impacted my life deeply, and I hope it will impact all of us personally with the transforming truths of this text here. It's a story of two families on two continents in two countries. One family knew Jesus and the other didn't. In fact, the other family, all they knew was bitterness and anger and malice. One of the families was missionaries. The other family was murderers, literally spearing their own people to death and any outsiders who came near. This unreached people was considered unreachable. Dayuma's family was savage warriors. Rachel Saint's family wanted to reach into the heart of Ecuador to those people. They, they believed the word of God was, and the gospel was, was for every tribe and tongue and people, not just for the nation of Ecuador. It's a story of savages and saints, literal savages in the deep Amazon rainforest, and Rachel's family were literally saints. That was their last name, Rachel Saint. Many of you already know the story, but I want you to consider it afresh with me in light of today's text. The story of gospel-powered forgiveness in Ecuador and our story. The Saint family of Pennsylvania had two children who became missionaries in the 1950s, Down in Ecuador, Rachel Saint was a Bible translator. Dayuma's family, she was born deep in Ecuador. Here's actually before her, Nate Saint, Rachel's brother, was a missionary pilot in Ecuador. 
with his family, his wife Marge and their children Kathy and Steve Saint. We'll come back to them later. Dayuma was born in Ecuador deep in the South American rainforest in the 1930s, nearly 100 years ago. This, this picture was from 1960. She was part of the Huarani or Waudani tribe, which was, they were known to the outsiders as the Alka Indians, the most feared, savage, violent society any new uh, anthropologists have studied this group. When, his, when Dayuma's family was being murdered by a warrior from their people, she fled from her life. And she was accepted by the Quechua Indians. And she, years later, would meet the missionary, Rachel Saint, who began to learn their Waodani language from her in hopes of one day reaching those people. She became the first Waodani Christian. The first fulfillment of that promise where God is ransomed from every tribe and tongue and nation and people that will be around the throne. She was the first of that tribe and people group. In 1955, Rachel's brother, Nate Saint, that pilot you saw earlier, and Jim Elliott, three other missionaries, met with Dayuma to learn her language so they could try to fly in and make a friendly visit to her people and try to tell them about the gospel of grace in Jesus. And so in January of 1956, they flew into the jungle and they were met by three Waodani. Dayuma's sister was one of those, Gimare. And there was a friendly visit on a river beach. Here's some pictures of Nate Saint trying to explain uh, what they had landed in. They'd never seen anything modern like that up close before. Roger Udarian, Pete Fleming, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and Ed McCauley had a heart to reach these peoples, and they made contact with them. And Jim Elliott's journal of October 28 says these words. Many of you have heard them before. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. This man later went to his people and he lied. He told them the missionaries were bad people. I believe he told them they were cannibals and that they should kill them. And so the Waodani people, led by Dayuma's uncle, Gekita, and her cousin, Menkaye, they came to them on the beach and they attacked them and they killed all five of those missionaries on the beach. The missionaries had guns, but they chose not to use them because they had already decided if, if they want to kill us, we'd rather give our lives. We're ready to meet God. They're not. We want to show them love. Here's Nate Saint's son, Steve, who was four years old at the time. You might think if you were four years old and this had happened to your dad, how would you think of these people growing up who had killed your father? Here's Nate's Wife, Marge, Steve's mom, back at the camp, waiting for radio contact. How would she feel towards her husband's killer? There was a Life article, cover story. Some of you maybe remember if you were alive then. Go ye and preach the gospel, five do and die. I want us to think about our text in light of this. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. For he himself, this is God, is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. But what if something like that has happened in your family? I mean, does this scripture still apply, Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you? What about the most horrible things like that, where they've killed your beloved family member? Does the gospel give power to obey the Lord's commands even then? Well, in 1958, two women came out of the jungle to find Dayuma. To ask her to come back. Dayuma did go back to her people who had killed her family to tell them the gospel that she had learned from the missionaries, the way of forgiveness rather than violence, the way of Jesus, not 
man. And as she went there, they had many questions that she didn't yet understand in her Christian faith that she wanted to see if there could be others who could help them with their questions. She had already forgiven them. She had given them what she knew, but she needed help to reach more. And so Dayuma went back to the Kichua village and invited Rachel Saint and Elizabeth Elliot. So this is Nate Saint's sister, Elizabeth Elliot, whose husband also had died with those five, to go back with her to teach the Waurani the Bible. Rachel was moved by the gospel to risk her life, to to seek to reach these people who had taken her brother's life. Elizabeth Elliot had her three-year-old daughter, Valerie, at the time, and she moved into the jungle as well. Imagine that. Here's a picture of her with her little daughter, Valerie, walking into the jungle. And here's Rachel with the Waodani people. And by the power of the gospel, many of Dayuma's family, as they saw these missionaries come, knowing that they had killed their family, their hearts were touched, their hearts were transformed. Many of them, Christianity literally changed their culture of death and, and in a real tangible way kept them from being extinct, which they would have been probably in that generation. Dayuma's uncle, Gekita, and her cousin, Minkai, who had been the murderer's of the missionaries, both were saved and both became leaders of the Waodani Church. I don't know if either of them are still alive, but here's Rachel Saint, who chose to spend the entire rest of her life with the Waodani people. She loved them. She was like a grandmother to them. They called her Star. That was her name. The one who showed them, like a star, how to walk God's trail. And here's her marking that they have out there. Here's Marge Saint in 1997 embracing Minkai, the former murderer of her husband, Nate Saint, now a forgiven friend in Christ. What happened to the children in that picture? Steve and Kathy. Well, Nate Saint's children, Steve and Kathy, also became close to the Waodani. Nate Saint's daughter, Kathy, here is being baptized by the tribesmen, Kim and Dewey. Um, her brother, Steve Saint, is going to wait to be baptized. When they were going to be baptized, they wanted to be baptized by these men because their family had been so knitted to them. This is June 1965. This is nine years after their dad was murdered near this very spot. They wanted to go back to this very spot as a testament of God's grace. And this is where they wanted to be baptized. It's a hard spot to, to get to. You've got to go into Ecuador. You've got to ride a lot of hours on a bus till the road stops. And then you've got to take a, a plane ride down another place. And then there's a canoe ride for four hours that gets you to this spot. But here is Steve Saint's children, Sean, Stephanie, and Jesse. These are now the grandchildren of, of Nate and Marge. Also were baptized there where their dad, Steve, and Aunt Kathy were years before, where their grandpa, Nate Saint, had died. There were, their Waodani brothers and sisters were baptized that day. Here's a picture of Steve Saint, Nate's son, and Menkaye, Dayuma's cousin, again, the one who had killed Steve's dad, now a forgiven brother in Christ. And Menkaye explained this in his own words. We acted badly, badly until they brought us God's Carvings. They didn't have any paper or parchment they knew of, but they, that's how they describe writings, carvings. And then seeing his carvings and following his good trail, now we live happily and in peace. And then here's Minkai and Jesse Saint, son of Steve Saint, again, grandson of the pilot. Jesse considers Minkai his adopted grandfather. And when he graduated high school, he asked, is there any way we could get Minkai to come to America to see my graduation. That's not easy to do when you've got no documentation, paperwork in the jungle, but they were able to get away for him to actually come because he wanted him to be there as his adopted grandfather for the grandfather that he never knew. I got to one of the highlights of my life, go to Ecuador in 2002 and with Steve Saint and with Jesse Saint, 
And here is, he's actually, I'm in the other canoe, he's telling firsthand, this is the very place, the very beach, of God's grace in the river where that story all happened. I got to meet Dayuma, one of the heroes of the faith to me growing up as a missionary kid, hearing her story. I got to actually take a picture with her. It was incredible. And here's me and Minkai. This is a, an unforgettable time with an unforgettable man who has the most joy in the Lord of anyone I've ever seen. It's, it's unbelievable to, to, to spend time with this guy and to think this guy used to be a mass murderer. And then in 2003, they came to Shepherd's Conference. I, I think at least a couple of you were there, and Minkai and Steve told their story. It was unforgettable. There wasn't a dry eye in the place. As these beloved brothers in Christ told of his transforming grace. Minkai actually, when he was in Southern California, held our little daughter, and he asked me in their language, can I take her back to the jungle? And I said, no. <laughs> I think he was kidding, but I'm, I'm not completely sure. But he just, you see that great smile. And as you see, as I spent time with them, seeing these two men interact with each other, I've never seen such a love that you see in these two men and how deeply they care for each other. Steve actually chose to move his entire family to the jungle to live with them. And as I said before, Mankai is just one of the most joyful men I've ever met. The only way you can explain any of that story is by the power of the gospel. It's, it's the gospel that you, is the only way to explain any of that. There's no human or natural explanation for any of that. It is only the supernatural, soul-transforming power of the gospel that Paul's talking about in Ephesians 4 when he talks about how you can, be, you can put off wrath and anger and bitterness and clamor, and you can be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. It's crucial to understand that forgiveness, and I want us to Consider in our time here, why should we have this forgiveness? Why is this important? It starts in our hearts. And then what is it to grant forgiveness in our words? And then how should we ask forgiveness in our relationships? Because we haven't had things like that happen in our family, but there's things that trouble you. There's things that have hurt you and have wounded you. And verse 32 starts in the heart to be kind and tenderhearted as we forgive others. Why should we have this forgiveness? It's because of what God has done for us. It's because of the gospel. The end of verse 32, God in Christ has forgiven us. That's those who have put their faith and trust in Christ and what he's done for their sin on the cross, they've been forgiven. Colossians 3.13, if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. We're commanded, when we have a complaint against someone else, we're commanded to forgive them as the Lord has forgiven us. And it says in Colossians 3, a parallel passage right before that, put on a compassionate heart. This starts in the heart. Anytime you have a complaint, forgive in a heart of compassion. That that doesn't mean never giving loving admonishments later, but it does mean first we need to be in the right place in our heart. We can give feedback to them, but we need to forgive first. Here's a, another passage, Mark eleven twenty five. You might want to write that down. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone. So do any of you have anything against anyone? Here's the word of the Lord to you. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive. Present tense. Keep on forgiving while you're praying. Again, it comes to your mind what you have against this person. Right then and there, you need to forgive. The other person is not there. It's you and the Lord. You're standing there. You're praying. Forgive. Forgive. That's a command, and it starts in a heart that forgives. A tender heart is a, a tenderized heart that can be kind, tenderized by how God has been so loving to us. Steve Saint wrote how the gospel was what helped him 
to forgive. And not only to forgive, I mean, that alone is amazing, but then to want to give his life to these people. Elizabeth Elliot also has written about how the gospel was what helped her to love her enemies and to move her to even be willing to to lay their life on the line and her three-year-old daughter to go into the jungle. She believed Christ died for the Waodani, for every tribe, and knowing that her husband had died for them made her love them even more. She writes about this in her book, The Savage, My Kinsman. If you want more of that story, The Savage, My Kinsman is a great story. Steve Sane also has written a couple books that are helpful as well. The gospel can literally turn killers into kinsmen. That's what it did for them, but it also did that for Paul. Remember, the one who's writing Ephesians, he originally was a killer of Christians in the book of Acts, and yet they later welcomed him as a brother in Christ, as a kinsman. Murderers can be transformed to missionaries. In fact, the Waodani, as, as they were saved, they wanted to reach other tribes with the gospel. The gospel can literally turn savages into saints. The gospel can take what you struggle to forgive and do a work in your heart so that you can forgive others as a testament to the world of that gospel grace. It changes the forgiven to be forgiving. Think about that story again. If they could forgive with God's help, you can forgive. Whatever it is, if you know forgiveness, if you know what grace is, you can't honestly say, I could never forgive so-and-so. If you honestly know the God who has done the impossible in saving you and forgiving your far greater sin, trust him to do what seems impossible to you. And this all starts in the heart. Forgiveness from the heart means in your heart, and, and, and you re- that flows out in your actions, but you resolve not to make pay those who hurt you. How might that look like in Ephesians 4, 31, a way that we might make them pay is from our bitter heart, our angry words, our malice, the way we speak about them to others. We've got to let others know what they did. Our clamor, that could be our raising our voice toward them, slander, saying things that aren't even true or not substantiated about them to others. We're not to, in verse 32, do any of those things. The flip side is we need to be tenderhearted, forgiving. That means we're not making them pay in those ways. In contrast to that, we're going to be kind to them. To forgive in the heart is defined as releasing a debt. That may be helpful to, to write down. You're releasing a debt. You're not making the offender pay Relationally, remember how Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Sin is a debt, but forgiveness is releasing that to the Lord. Forgiving trespasses is pardoning sin's debt. It's assumed in the Lord's Prayer, as much as we need daily bread, we equally need daily forgiveness, and we need to daily be forgiving others. Their sin debt. Jesus taught that in your private prayer closet to pray that way. That's where forgiving starts in the heart. There's a story, Matthew 18, verse 25. You can either turn there or listen to it, but Jesus gives a story about forgiveness, and he uses the image of a, of a debt But he's talking about relational forgiveness. But here's Matthew 18, 25. Speaking of a man who did not have means to repay. This kind of sounds like back in Exodus when people didn't, weren't able to pay back a debt. His Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. This is the very scenario in Exodus 22 we've been looking at. But here the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him 
and forgave that debt. But the slave went out, so that one who had just been forgiven and released, went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. And then this comes to the the Lord, the one who had originally forgiven that slave. And his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all of that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over. And it goes on to talk about how he, he was to now repay all that was owed him. And Jesus says, my heavenly father also will do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your hearts. If you don't have a heart of compassion in action, the Lord warns of serious consequences. Even a, a believer can have serious consequences and can be in a prison of bitterness and resentment and all kinds of effects to them. But think of that story. The slave who had been pardoned a massive unpayable sum had no patience for far lesser debts. And Jesus says it is wicked to mercilessly make others pay, even relationally, for what they did to feel no compassion like you received, moves the Lord's anger here in this passage. How dare you not forgive from your heart and not have mercy on a fellow slave in light of the gospel, in light of all your sins against God. You know, when you study his law, when you know his commandments and loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving your neighbor as yourself, you realize that every day of your life, and there, there's a, a, a vast list of sins that you've done, and then there's this sin towards this person you won't forgive. Why do you choke over compassion? Lord, have mercy on us, and we won't have mercy. This is not a small thing, by the way. There's a, a massive debt here, but this is not a small thing. A hundred denarii was a massive, a significant sum thousands of dollars, maybe tens of thousands of dollars, but the, what the original slave had owed was in the mega millions, if not billions, depending on the exchange rate. Our debt was infinite against God for our infinite amount of sins against God, and, and you're going to be unwilling to have mercy on someone? The master says in that story, should you not have had mercy in the same way I had mercy on you? It's a rebuke to us, and we don't forgive. And I do need to qualify, and I've brought this up before. There are times where there are consequences. There's times even where authorities need to be involved to bring consequences for physical loss, for criminal offenses. But I'm talking here, and Jesus is talking here about most interpersonal relational offenses. Forgiveness doesn't mean, if you think of a family, there's no discipline but loving discipline's goal is restoration. And, and put ourselves in the family context. It's not in a kid's power or position to be the one to spank his brother or sister. That's not his role. God the Father is the one who does that. He doesn't call us to punish by sinful words to them or about them. In the family of Christ, silent treatment or defriending them or whatever that's called. A brother or sister in Christ, whatever that sin was, that sin has been paid for on the cross. Are you going to insist they need to repay me too? That wasn't enough. Jesus paid it some, but I need to get some. No, Jesus paid it all. And I know limited redemption. I know those who don't repent aren't called redeemed in Scripture. But here's the sober reality. If they don't repent in this life, have their life right with God, they will pay for all eternity for that 
saying, I don't need to make them pay to me on top of that. To not forgive is basically to say, God, I know hell may be payment enough for you, but not for me. They need to pay relationally now because whatever payment you have coming in the future is not enough. Or, or for the redeemed to say, Christ's payment isn't enough. I need to get mine. We need to let God do his job. It's his to make pay. Vengeance is his. He will repay. He's not hiring debt collectors. He's not hiring a spiritual collections department and recruiting us for that. Think about the prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Can you say, do you say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, as I am being merciful to other sinners who sin against me? Do you want to be forgiven in the same way that you forgive others? You know what the next line in that prayer says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We need to be delivered from the evil of unforgiveness, of bitterness. That's a temptation for all of us. We need to pray, help me if you can't forgive. Say, help me forgive in my heart. Forgive me my sin of bitterness. Help me to release this to you. We need to daily pray to give up the sin that is eating us up. What Rachel and Marge and Elizabeth and Steve and those missionary families had to forgive is much more and much as we think of our sins against God, that's even much more than anything, some of the worst things that have happened here on this earth. But when we can actually see and think about how big our sin problem is against God, and remember how big our Savior is and how big and massive his mercy is in the gospel, that's the way that we can fulfill the first part of verse 32, it's empowered by the last part, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. So this is written to believers. This is not possible for unbelievers in the sense. This is for believers, those who have confessed their sins, who have confessed that Jesus is Lord, who are trusting him as Savior. And I don't want to assume that's everyone here in this room. Have, have you confessed your sin to the Lord, seen how big your sin is? Have you asked him to save you and to change you? Because he forgives those who come in that way. But we're not automatically forgiven. We've got to come humbly, repentantly to him. And that brings up a question in this passage. If God forgives only us when we repent, do we need to do verse 32 with those who have not yet repented? Some would teach we may not or, or must not forgive unless someone asks forgiveness. I think we need to be very careful here. Verse 31 has already talked about bitterness, how that needs to be put off. And when we're not obeying verse 32, those things in verse 31 grow. Don't let the sun go down on anger, he said earlier, verse 26. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. At least release it in your heart, even if you're not able to have a conversation to reconcile. You've got to deal with that in your heart before you go to bed. Unforgiving, unkind, unrepentant, hard hearts need to obey. Verse 32, we need to be kind to others, tenderhearted, forgiving. But think about verse 32. Is God kind only to the repentant? I mean, we read earlier how God is kind all the time to people who are his enemies, to evil, ungrateful, unrepentant people. He's kind all the time in his common grace. His kindness lets them live and move and have their being and keep breathing right now. That's his kindness. That kindness is to lead to repentance. That's not a kindness that's only shown after repentance. And so that's... The first part of verse 32, the next phrase for tender-hearted compassion is also used in that, that root word of Jesus when he saw the, the multitudes of people like sheep without a shepherd. These are unbelievers here. His heart was moved with compassion, tender-hearted mercy to them. 
That's the Lord's heart. And these words in Ephesians 4.32 are not only for repentant believers in God's word. In fact, the word for forgive is used in Luke 7 for grace that Jesus freely gave to all. And he uses the language of a debt that couldn't be paid. And it's translated there to graciously forgive. This is a word that can mean unilateral, unconditional forgiveness. When we're talking about the heart different than reconciliation, but the root idea of this word is the gracious giving or bestowing of something unmerited and undeserved. It's not because the other party did something necessarily. It's a gracious decision. In fact, someone suggested we could translate part of Ephesians 4.32, at least the idea, choose to be gracious as God chose to be gracious to you. This type of forgiving doesn't depend on the sinner. It depends on grace. And there's different words translated forgive in the New Testament. This one has the root word charis from Ephesians chapter 2. When we were dead in our sins, unresponsive, unrepentant, spiritually dead, God gave his grace to us. And God calls us to take the initiative for those who may not respond by grace, like God did for us. I don't think the point of this passage is how strict I can be in the conditions that a sinner needs to meet before verse 32, and he needs to say these words, and if he doesn't say it right, I'm okay to stay in verse 31. No, I think the point is how free and gracious we can be. Like Jesus said, freely you've received, freely give. And if you're unwilling to show that kind of grace... Do you know this kind of grace? Do you know what that's like? Because of the gospel, we should have forgiveness in our hearts. But what is it to grant forgiveness in our words? This is where someone does come. And if they were to apologize, to say, I forgive you. If they don't recognize their sin and you say you forgive them, they're not going to understand why you're even saying that. But to When they ask for forgiveness, that's also something that Scripture talks about. There needs to be loving confrontation at times. There needs to be conversation, restoration in person with significant grievances. But Ephesians 4.31 tells us we need to put off bitterness and anger and sinful speech before we're in a place to do that. We need to be putting on kind actions in hope that maybe that can lead to a verbal transaction of forgiveness and restoration. Sometimes we need to tenderheartedly tell someone how we were hurt and, and not assume that they even meant that, but to let them know there's, a, there's something here that we need to talk about and to do that in private, Scripture says, one-on-one. Don't go tell others about that. Go to the person or go to the Lord, give it to him. But if you, if you can't get past it, sometimes there are times where you need to Share that with them. Galatians 6 says, if you need to restore, do it in a spirit of gentleness that may move them to repentance. And if they do say, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean that, but I'm, I'm sorry, just be quick to say, I forgive you, brother. Don't say, well, we need to, we need to talk about this for another 30 minutes say, when they say, I, I'm sorry. Say, I forgive you. Brother, see, it, this starts in the heart, but reconciliation needs a conversation. It's a, it's a two-way sh- street, and it does take both parties to be reconciled, ideally one-on-one, but sometimes a brother or sister can help where that's needed. We see that in Philippians 4. You can forgive in your heart before it's expressed verbally, and I think you should normally, but here's one of the tests of Forgiveness is to ask yourself, do I want to reconcile with this person? Now, accepting an apology doesn't always mean you automatically trust them, especially if there's been a whole bunch of other things. But it is willing to rebuild. There should be a a willingness to rebuild, not just to say, I forgive you, but I don't want to ever see you again. But here's something else that it's, it's not, and I think it's important to understand Granting forgiveness, even when you say those words, even if they recognize their sin and you say those words, that doesn't mean you forget 
It, it's not, and nor is it just saying, oh, just, just forget about it. You know, if the Spirit has been moving in someone and they confess something to you, there's, ah, forget about it. Or forget about it, you know, wherever you're, some people say. It's, that's not what this is. And that's not part of forgiveness in the heart or in forgiveness in your words that you grant or say. God doesn't erase memories of past hurt. That's not the measure of whether you've truly obeyed verse 32. How many of you have heard the expression, forgive and forget? Raise your hand if you've heard people say that. That's not in the Bible. Here's what Vodi Bakum explains. People think and they're, they're tormenting themselves. I keep remembering it. That means I haven't forgiven because if I forgive, that means I forget, right? He says, what book of the Bible is that? Second hesitations? That's not in the Bible. What the Bible says is God remembers sins no more, which doesn't mean God is no longer omniscient. What that means is God chooses not to bring into evidence those against you or make you pay for those anymore. The Bible never tells you you have to forget. We're not created to forget. In fact, when we forget things, something's wrong. We're malfunctioning. When, when we begin to forget more and more, that's a sign there's something wrong. How ridiculous it is to beat yourself up because you can't do what God created you not to be able to do normally. To forgive someone is not to forget or pretend it didn't happen. It's to cancel a debt. It's to remove your right or even your desire, I would say, to make that person pay for what they did. So what is it when we say, what are some things to think about God, as God has forgiven us? What does that look like if you're going to say, I forgive you to someone? Here's one. I won't bring it up to myself or dwell on it. I think when it talks about God forgetting our sins, that's the idea, or I should say, not remembering our sins anymore. Here's Micah 7, 18 and 19. A God like you pardoning iniquity, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And so that's how God forgives us. If we're going to forgive that way, we're not going to go diving down and then to drag back up the, or to go trolling around the bottom to bring up some of that garbage from the past. There's no fishing allowed when sins have been cast in the depths of the sea. Don't go down. Don't dwell there would be another way to say that. Thoughts can come into our mind that we may not feel like we can control at times, but we are responsible for what we do with those thoughts and those memories and keep going back to God's forgiveness. Here's a second one. So I won't bring it up to myself. I'll, I'll strive to do that. I'm, I'm committing to do that, but I'm also not going to bring this up to you. Here's what God's forgiveness looks like in Isaiah 38, 17. The prophet says, I had great bitterness but in love you delivered. And he says this, you have cast all my sins behind your back. There's another picture down at the bottom of the sea, but also they're behind my back, which is another way to say the same thing, but it's, it's in the past now. It's behind me, and, and even the small of your back, I, I can't reach it. Some of you are more flexible than me, but the, the point of the image there is that it's, it's in the past. We're not going to turn around. We're not going to go back. It's behind us, so don't go back in bitterness. Don't keep rehearsing that, and certainly don't bring it up. Keep bringing it up to them when you've said, I forgive you for that. You're not going to keep bringing that up to them, and number three, I won't bring it up to others. This is important. We should do this before we forgive even as well. Commit not to bring up that to others. But you know what God says about how he forgives? Listen to Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember your sins no more, declares the Lord. He wipes them out, but it's for his own sake. It's, it's for the Lord's sake. It's not for our sake. If you struggle to have forgiveness of someone, to, to really wipe that out. You, you want to share it with someone else to, to not realize this, but it's been wiped out. And it, do it for God's sake. Do it for Christ's sake, not for your sake, not for the other person's sake. Strive to refuse to remember that sin. Jay Adams gives some help in his book, From Forgiven to Forgiving, 
to not remember it in that sense that it's been wiped out is like, it's like you've buried it, but you know where it's buried in your yard. What you're committing to do, you, you still know it's there. You're not going to go and dig that back up. He says this, I will not bring up these matters to you or others in the future. I will bury them and I will not exhume the bones to beat you over the head with them anymore. I will not bring this up again to you. You've acknowledged it, apologize, I have forgiven you, I'm not going to bring that up. And then fourthly, and finally, I won't keep a wall up between us. I won't let it hinder our relationship Isaiah 59, 2 says, our sin does separate us from God. But listen to Ephesians 2, 14. It says, Jesus himself is our peace, who has made the two into one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And he's talking about Jew and Gentile and their great uh, enmity that they had in hostility. And he says he did all this to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death the hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, to you who were near. When you study the hostility between Jew and Gentile in the first century, you see if God could bring unity among those, he can bring unity to any of us. And so part of this commitment is I'm, I'm not going to now let this be a, a wall. I'm not going to let it hinder relationship. And again, that doesn't mean that there's not rebuilding over time, but there's a willingness to do that. doesn't mean you automatically trust someone who's had a long track record, but it, you're, you're willing to seek to rebuild. What if you someone had done some of the most horrible things to you or your family, like the story I began with, or in the 20, 20th century, you know the story of Corrie ten Boom, at least many of you do. She was in a concentration camp. Her sister, Betsy, died there at the hands of the brutal guards. But she, by God's grace, knew the gospel and had many opportunities to go and speak about how God could change her heart to not hate but to even love her enemies and how God can wash away all of our sins. And she was speaking at a Christian church and there was someone in the room who had actually been one of those guards at that concentration camp. And as he heard her words of hope, he was just so moved. And he came up to her afterwards. And he said, how grateful I am for your message, Fräulein, to think that as you say, he has washed away all my sins. And then he stuck his hand out. He stuck his hand out to her, to shake hers. And she says, this is her writing, I who had preached about the need to forgive, this is in her book, The Hiding Place, she says, I just preached about the need to forgive, my hand would not move. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, so this is where that sin can just boil back up, even though you, you feel like you've dealt with it now, all of a sudden you're face to face with this person, she says, I saw the sin of my thoughts Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask more? Lord Jesus, I prayed. I think this is just in, in her heart now. Forgive me and help me to forgive him. She says, I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing. Not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. I don't know how many moments this was, but she says, I again breathe a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive this man. Give me your forgiveness. And then she describes how she took his hand and the most incredible thing happened in that little step of, of reaching out. It says from her shoulder through her arm and through her whole body, it was like this, this warmth came through her 
while into her heart, all of a sudden sprang this love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed her. She, and then she says this, when Jesus tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command, the love. Wonderful picture there. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes we don't feel it. But we need to take, a, take steps in obedience, trusting that he will meet us on the way. What if we realize we need to ask forgiveness? How should this impact how we ask? Ken Sandy has written a wonderful book, The Peacemaker. In fact, those principles, if I didn't mention earlier, are from his book, The Peacemaker, his chapter on forgiveness. He has a chapter on asking forgiveness. If, 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 if you need to do that, there's no better place I know of to study. These are just some of what he writes in there. There's more. But when we ask forgiveness, we need to address all that our sin impacted. I think it was last week we looked at Zacchaeus when he realized he had wronged people. He says, I'm going to go to everyone I've wronged and I'm going to restore it fourfold. Remember that? That's, that's the heart of a repentant person. Whoever my sin has impacted, when I find that out, I'm going to go, I'm going to make it right. That's the Zacchaeus principle. That can look like people who have witnessed your sinful speech even about someone or to someone. You want to make it right with that person, but then you also want to say, will you forgive me for this? I should not have spoken that way. I don't want to keep doing that. Help me. Help me be accountable to that. But I, whether or not this bothered you as much as it bothers me, I need to ask, will you forgive me for speaking that way to you or even in your presence? Here's a a big one for me that I think it's just natural for me to, to want to throw little words in there to, to make it not seem as bad as it is or to, to make little excuses. And that could be if or but. Yeah, I say something, but you <laughs> or maybe. That's, that's not a good asking forgiveness. Just, just try to even have that in your mind. Avoid those words if but maybe, now there might be times you're not sure that you offended someone. You can say, I, I think I may have offended you. I, I could be wrong, but I, I need to ask if, if so and share that situation. But I think sometimes people say, well, you know, if I offended someone, then I'm, I'm sorry. You know, if they've got a problem, I'm, I'm sorry. That, that's not a good asking for forgiveness. It's kind of putting it on the other person rather than yourself. Read Psalm 51. See how David confessed to God. No excuses. Psalm 32, verse 5. And then I think it's good to admit specifically, like in Luke 15, 21, when the prodigal son comes back to his dad, he says, I've sinned before heaven and in your sight. He recognized the wrong of what he had done, leaving home and all of that, taking his inheritance like he wished his father was dead, and now he's coming back and he says, just... I'm not worthy to be called your son, but would you at least let me be like one of your slaves? He admitted specifically what he's done. He came humbly. We also need to acknowledge the hurt. Sometimes there's healing that's needed. We confess our sins, pray to one another so that we may be healed. Sometimes we need to acknowledge. And you're not even saying that you meant to do that. You're recognizing that there was a hurt there, and you're just saying, I am sorry for that hurt. And then to ask these words. Some people just say sorry, but I, I think the biblical phrase is, will you forgive me for? Will you forgive me for this? I want to read what Ken Sandy says talking about whether it's heart forgiveness or granting forgiveness, you may need to bear certain effects of the other person's sin over a long period of time. This may involve fighting against painful memories, speaking gracious words when you really want to say something hurtful, working to tear down walls and be vulnerable when you still feel little trust, or even enduring the consequences that the other person is unable or unwilling to repair. Forgiveness can be extremely costly, but if you believe in Jesus... You have more than enough 
to make those payments because by going to the cross, he has already paid off the ultimate debt of sin and he has established, I like this image, he's established an account of abundant grace that you can withdraw from at any time. You can withdraw every day from this unlimited resource and and riches of his grace and you will find you have all that you need in Christ to make the payments of forgiveness for those who have wronged you. Put off all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you and walk in love. As Ephesians 5, 2 says, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray to him. Our great God, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness that is available in him and that is ours when we trust in you. And Lord, we know there's even sins that we haven't asked you to forgive us for that we don't even recognize, and yet you're so merciful and gracious to us. But we thank you that because of redemption, Lord, those things are paid for. And Lord, I pray for any who are in a place, in a dark place right now, in their hearts right now. Lord, I pray that you would move in their hearts to be able to obey your truth by the power of the gospel. I thank you for how you've done that in my life. And Lord, I still have much to grow in these areas, even in my own family. Lord, help me, help us all in our families and in our friendships. In Jesus' name, amen.